to our study session on the legislative priorities. Um, we have a special guest here today, um, Marie Sullivan. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of your last name. Anyway, is going to present um, some legislative priorities that the board will go over. And so we'll turn time over to you, Marie. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Nice to see you in person, not on our Zoom calls. Um, so we are here today to talk uh, about possible priorities for the 2022 legislative session. Just as a reminder, the 2022 session is a short session. That means it's a 60 day session. It's a supplemental budget session. Um, so mainly tweaks to the operating and capital budgets. Um, and so usually they won't take on really big um, things that cost a lot of money or big policy items that are going to take a lot of time, right? All the bills that were introduced last session are alive, again, this session. So there are some things that we are watching and we will keep an eye on those again. But we were trying to figure out, and so Sarah, Michelle, and I all talked about what might be some things that bubble to the top that are priorities. Y you can set aside COVID and say these are things that are actionable that we would like to see some uh, legislative action on uh, sooner than later. And so we're kind of playing long game, short game, but, um, but taking a look. So, the five things that we came up with, I think you'll see, and these are really just for discussion. Um, but looking at uh, what would we prioritize, what would we talk to legislators about, what would we um, focus on? So the first one is really about investing in additional district staff. And this is um, that are focused on that social emotional health and safety of staff. So school nurses, school counselors, school psychologists, behavioral health, social workers, um, the kind of people who provide those wraparound services and help with just the um, academic, but also the non-academic pieces of a student's success. So uh, I think you all know, uh, prototypical school funding model is woefully underfunded, right? They might give you could look to Sarah for point two of a psychologist or something, um, you know, for 8,000 students. So um, this is actually about trying to, to get that number invested. Uh, three years ago in 2019, there was the staff enrichment work group. Uh, OSPI is going to be making a significant request this year for school nurses. Um, and I think the other piece that we're hoping to see is maybe that school counselor that was for the high poverty schools being extended to all um, as a possibility. So um, I guess, um, uh, uh, Madam President, <laughs> uh, Board Chair, how would you, would you like me to go through each of these and then we open it to discussion? Would you like to have conversation kind of about each and every one? I, I think we should go through each of them at least briefly and then have a discussion on how the board feels about including those those five. So. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so that's the first one about additional uh, staff. The second one is, is also an issue of underfunding. This has been a chronic issue, but I think it's really um, come to the forefront, particularly this year, but it's about adjusting the student per pupil transportation funding formula. Um, to eliminate district subsidization. And I think when I was talking with Michelle and Sarah, you are typically subsidizing two million, three million a year um, when the state has, should be funding pupil transportation. Part of that is because of course it's based on ridership. It's also based on an efficiency model that takes the lesser of um, you know, what your actual costs were the previous year compared to other districts of your size and things like that. So it's a really wonky formula that always leaves everybody underfunded. So I think there's a strong sense that 
last year the legislature took action when there were emergencies to say you can't always have it based on ridership because there are times when the buses are doing other things they're bringing school to the to the student um, but it's also about getting that that full funding so that's that's a piece there the third piece is around and this is something that's been on your agenda for quite a while but this this arbitrary number of the 50 percent that uh, marks high poverty lap so there are many different times when that high poverty lap 50 percent threshold comes into play and it disadvantages some of your bigger schools it disadvantages some of your just uh, students who are um, depending on what school they're attending so um, this is actually saying instead of it, it's kind of rolling it back to let's look at the state average instead of having an arbitrary number you might remember last year we took a, a swing at the larger elementary schools we were successful in getting that into the house operating budget um, so that it would have been a 45 percent if you had an elementary school that had 600 students and was 45 percent free and reduced price meal um, but we just didn't get it through the senate um, so uh, we could swing at that again but you've also made some changes to the way your k-5 you've moved your sixth graders around and things like that so anyway i think the staff was thinking just uh, trying to go back and say the state average for poverty is probably a better threshold than some arbitrary number uh, fourth thing is around adjusting the ale funding formula to provide hundred percent of funding so right now a student that's participating in an alternative learning experience program it's 85 cents on the dollar it's basically 85 percent of uh, a 1.0 student fte and the thought here is that you have some very specialized programs so uh, rather than giving you less money for your ala programs this would be seeking 100 percent um, so regardless of your so like your academy, your online academy and other programs um, seeking 100% funding, not the 85%. And then the last thing here is again, something that's been very much underfunded, which is special education. Um, students with disabilities um, really deserve uh, uh, more attention. And we know that uh, the state just underfunds as well as the feds. So this is about trying to increase that support. So those are the five um, priorities that we suggested. Um, and we would turn these into um, some briefing papers for each one of them or whichever the board decides. And then we also had a few things that we can discuss about just um, other options to support things around kind of local control, um, you know, matching funds for school construction, graduation pathways, expanding pathways for high school students, um, supporting programs to retain it and recruit and retain effective and diverse workforce, and then uh, something around the experience factor to reward uh, educators who have more experience and more education. So that's kind of the, the broad brush. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, is five a good number or do we want it, do you want us to reduce that or do you just want our opinion on whether or not we should put this on or, or have these be our legislative pri priorities? So I would always say that um, in a short session, fewer is always a little bit easier to handle, but I don't want to lose priorities that are that are important to the board. So I think we wanted to start with what were what were the things that we thought were um, the highest priority, and then there might be a thought here where we look at a two-year agenda where um, some things are really a focus for this 2022 session, um, and there are others that we know are kind of more of a long game uh, approach that we're working on to lay foundations during the 22 year setting up for 2023. Okay, great. S Steve, do you have opinions to add to this since this is your area of expertise? I don't. I think this looks good. And um, 
there's lots of things that we could use help with from the legislature and, and they're mentioned here. I mean, all of these are important. There's probably others. As you mentioned, Marie, there's a limit on how much we can really advocate for and how much appetite there is for some of these over there. But I think this is a good list and I would, um, I would just ask, is there, there's five listed there. They're listed one through five. Is that an order of priority as recommended by the district or is that a, it was just five and that was the order they happened to be written down? I'm gonna defer to your superintendent, I think on that. I don't believe they're in any priority order. Okay. So, um, and I think just looking at these, so the one that's listed as number one, I think is going to be a high priority for WASDA this year. I, I think all districts are wanting some change to that uh, prototypical school funding formula. And so I, I think that one is going to get a lot of priority. And I would, uh, I think number five, the special education budget has also been a big one for a number of years. I think OSPI anyway has been working on that one. So I would, I would suggest that certainly we could advocate for those two. On the transportation funding formula, so that's a priority for us or would be, do you know how much of a priority is that around the state? It's, you know? a, it's a huge priority right now. Um, I can tell you that both the House and the Senate are coming up with their own ideas around the funding formula. Um, but there's a an emerging issue too around bus drivers. And so when I was talking to Superintendent Whitney and I'm hearing that, you know, there's a bus shortage, a, a driver shortage right now of 18 to 20 and no substitutes. Um, we were talking about what, are there some things in it, the funding formula is a problem, but what are some things also that might, the legislature might be in a position to do to help you with pipeline issues, you know, do, reduce any barriers. We we're talking about, is there a difference between what's required of a public transit bus driver versus a school bus driver? So, you know, identifying some of those things that maybe are actionable that, that could reap some short-term mm -hmm. as well as some long-term benefits. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's buried in there, but uh, you know, is it, do you need to have bonus incentives? Um, you know, what are the different ideas out there to, to help increase that pipeline? Or increase the pay. Our, our commercial truck drivers get paid considerably more um, than our bus drivers. So, and we'd love to pay them more, but it's, it's just not possible at this point. Well, I guess everything's possible, but not life, so. Right, if you're already subsidized it by you know, several million dollars, adding in a, a higher pay may make it more costly, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, so that would be a good one. And uh, so we have General Assembly here where, where we will go through these in, as a WASDA organization and see where that one comes up. But certainly locally, we can prioritize that. And we're probably not the only district. I mean, we're on the rural side of the state and I'm guessing rural districts have a bigger, a bigger need for transportation funding, so. So can you tell me again what alternative learning funding is? Is that AL or it, alternative learning education? It is, it's, uh, it's alternative learning uh, education and it's, Several years ago, the legislature, and I'll, I'll have um, Superintendent Whitney explain a little bit, but it's, it's your online learning, it's your parent partnerships, it's kind of alternative, um, it's not your alternative high schools um, necessarily, but um, so anyway, I'll, yeah. So do we get partial funding for those kids then? We don't get? You get 80, 85% of the funding. So it's, it's basically 85 cents for every dollar that you would get. So a dollar for a, a regular gen ed student that's in a brick and mortar classroom, 85 cents for a student who's in an ALE program. And does it cost more than 85 cents per student to 
to educate those kids when they're off campus so much? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that's the question we would need to be prepared to ask, answer for a legislator. That's the question we're gonna get asked. So just for clarity for the board, those are our students who are enrolled in our IPAL program, our virtual high school, our new Pixel program, and then the partner, the P3 programs. So I think the question around does it cost as much really has to do with what you're providing. And I think that varies widely across the state. So as we're building out our new Pixel program, for example, we're ensuring that students that have enrolled in the Pixel program have access to special education services. They have access to two-way dual language programs. They basically are having access to the same programming might not look exactly the same, but the, pro the spirit of the same programming is we're offering in our brick and mortar schools. So to do that, you know, when you're scaling programs, there's efficiency and scale when you're funding programming. So when you're, cho when you're choosing to continue to honor all of the programs we offer in brick and mortar in, an, in a virtual learning program, it is going to cost us more than 85 cents on the dollar. So. And then the question is around, well, what about brick and mortar? Well, those students are still required. I mean, in this virtual environment, it's been differently different, but in a normal environment, they are still required to come touch base in person with a teacher on an interval for a required amount of time. Mm -hmm. That does require space. And in a school district like ours, where space is a, a commodity, right? I mean, we're, we're limited in space. It is requiring that we think thoughtfully about spaces. We've had to add, we used a, a portable at, we housed the, uh, IPAL program and portables, so we have had to use district funds to support our ALE programs in the past for facilities. So I think it's a worthy ask, you know, when school districts, when these numbers for school districts were, were less, we're, we have almost 600 kids right now under the umbrella of what we're calling digital learning. Uh, Mira will give you a comprehensive report next meeting on a study session. Um, and I think those numbers will continue to increase as some families find that these environments provide flexibility that they're enjoying. So um, I, th I think it's a worthy, a, a worthy concept to talk about with legislators. I, I do think that the question that you asked will be the one that we get. I think, I think what you're saying is probably fair for where we're at now at the beginning of a program, but uh, again, the difficult conversation becomes Look at all these companies, you know, globally, United States tech companies, Google, engineering companies, all kinds of companies are talking about reducing their actual office footprints because it's cheaper. And so I hear what you said there, but I think that what other people come back and say is, well, yeah, they, it, when you're getting it off the ground, I understand it takes a lot of that, but you also aren't, if, if you have a big program, you don't have to hire duties and aides and support staff. You do have to hire some of the certificated staff and the, the other staff you're talking about, but I think there, there'll still be that, that argument that it should be cheaper if you don't have seats in classrooms. But probably not 85%. We, yeah, we're gonna have to clearly show that we're paying more than the 85%. Do, do we still get credit when we go to matching and stuff like that? They're one FTE student as far as our enrollment or they're 0.85 there as well. Yeah, so right now, well, it's 600 kids, and I just did back of the envelope, and I actually did 85, per, I did 80%, but it would it'd be like a half a million to $800,000 difference. I mean, it's, I'm just, that's total back let of the net. Let me ask differently. If 9,000, if we expanded this program huge, and 9,000, half of our kids in the Pasco School District, you know, 9,000, 10,000 kids were remote learning, when we went to go look at our, you know, um, building matching and, and stuff like that, would they still consider us an 18,000 oh, kid district? No. Or would it be 85% of that? Or I don't it know the answer to that question. It's actually 85%. So an ALE student in school construction is less than a full brick and mortar student. And so it's still, in that scenario, it's overestimating, right? If 9,000 of our kids were remote, it'd be hard for us to go say we need to go build more huge, large buildings, you know, schools, et cetera. But we could in this scenario if we grew enough, even if a lot of them were remote. So there's, it's difficult all around, right, to use one, one number there. It, it, at 85%, it's overestimating as far as brick and mortar capacity. So I would, 
yeah, I don't know if it's overestimating, but I mean, it, it becomes a challenge um, with school construction. So, and it, it, yeah, they are not treated as a full-time FTE. So. so match does go down. Your poverty piece still remains the same, right? Which talks about your match piece, but. Your match goes down, but I'm saying if half of our students right now went remote, we'd be saying we have an 18,000 student population and we could get student, or we could get matching to build more buildings even though we don't need them. So it'd be overestimating what kind of brick and mortar capacity we need. Yeah, I think we'd have to check. I know they're not, I. I believe they are still at 85% with school construction, but probably worth checking. I know they're not less than half. So. Do you prioritize these on the ones that are more likely to get through or the ones that are more likely to reduce the total costs to our district or to, you know, yeah, reduce the costs that we have to pay? How do you usually prioritize those? Is that, isn't the money ever, does it, it, does that ever come into the equation? Ask that a different way, Amy. Like number one would be, I don't know, I would say several million dollars because we have so little, um, you know, we have so few nurses paid for and social workers and psychologists and counselors, they're, they just are not paid. We, we have so many of them that aren't paid at all through the FT. That, that monetarily, that is a huge one as well if you the transportation one, I think you told me, was about $2 million of extra. So those two are huge. Um, I, I just wondered if those would be prioritized because of their impact to the district financially. I think it is something you could consider. Um, you know, you, Pasco School District received a lot of federal funds, and I think the question is, as you're looking at new hires, and I, again, I'm looking at Superintendent Whitney. I mean, my assumption would be that you've hired additional um, nurses, additional as instructional assistants, people to help with the contact. I mean, there's all sorts of people you're using with those federal dollars. And so I think part of the idea here is how, how do you make sure that, that you sustain momentum with the people you have brought on to help with the the challenges that have emerged under COVID, as well as meet the non-academic needs of your students, right? Um, so, I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity there, but it is expensive. I mean, that's why they haven't done it. So, I think you can all remember back when I was working for WASDA, the um, Quality Education Council came up with ratios that would have improved the ratios and they were too expensive at the time and that was way back in, you know, 2010. Um, so they, they keep chipping at this and saying, we know we need more people, um, but the reality is right now you are, you are funding a number of staff out of your levy um, to meet the needs of your students. I think there's a couple of ways to look at it. So one would be what is the biggest impact to us as a district? Which one would be most impactful to us? And then I think, Amy, what you were alluding to is which ones are we likely to get any traction at the legislature? Yep. And I can tell you number one is going to be the biggest one. And, and everybody can show that, that we get what? One-tenth of a nurse per building or something like that, and every building has a nurse. And I think every district in the state can go to them and show that. And they know that. This is something that's been talked about for years. Uh, it really comes down to how much budget do they have to, to change that formula. So that's one that everybody's aware of and, they, and they, they know it needs to be done. And it will impact every district in the state. Uh, the transportation formula, that one might be a little harder to show because they might just say, we'll get more efficient with your buses or something like that. But with the increase in wages, it, it, that's going to have an impact. So uh, I think the ALE, that's one that's going to take years mm -hmm. to get funding for just because they're going to have, they're going to say, look, it doesn't cost you as much. And, and in reality, it probably doesn't. So that one's going to take years to get through. But if, it, if it's priority, then we need to start talking about it now. 
special ed, I think special ed and the prototypical school funding formula are the, probably the two that we're going to have the most uh, success with. What about, about Steve, that. what about improving state matching funds for schools construction, especially in property poor districts? Does that have yeah. not enough traction behind that one? It does, and, and again, there's a lot, I mean, I think everybody acknowledges that that's, that that needs to be adjusted. I mean, construction costs are, especially in the past couple of years, I mean, it was, it was bad two years ago, and in the past couple of years, it's just gotten worse. So I think everybody acknowledges that that needs to be adjusted. Now, some that wouldn't have a financial impact, I would think, would be the expanding graduation pathways for high school students. But again, when you're going in and making a proposal like that, they're going to say, well, what's your solution? So if we're going to, if we're going to talk about that, we need to know, we need to have some suggestions of what they should do. And I think the district does have some suggestions for those alternative path pathways. So, yeah, that, that, is, that is true that that one doesn't have it, a whole lot of money attached to it. So I, I agree with what you guys have said. I think one would be most impactful for us. I think for me, the next one would be five, followed by two. I think four is would be a lot of spinning the wheels to try and get traction that may not be there. Because again, the argument could go either way. We could argue that it should be one. Someone else could come right back at us and say it shouldn't be 0.85. It should be 0.65, and it would <laughs> it would take years to come to the right number there. And every school district's probably different as well, depending on how many they have enrolled and how, uh, how many years they've been doing what they're doing. But three, I don't know that I fully, I, I don't fully understand three, if you guys could explain that to us a little bit more. I thought that one had passed, so I was sad to see that one on again. I didn't realize it had failed in the Senate. So that was kind of, that was really sad. <laughs> What's it? Um, how does it impact us? Like what numbers and it, it's what, the one what it that we talked about where like 46% or 47% of our kids in a certain school are, are um, lower income and um, or yeah, anyway. And so, and we don't get any money. Yet if they hit 50%, then we get lap dollars. So we, we would uh, really like to get- Just prorating? Prorating, uh, especially proration. considering we can have a school here that's 47% kids that need help than this school right here because it's a smaller school. Does that make sense? This one has 450 kids that still need help. This one has 430, yet because this one's over 50%, it, it still gets lap dollars. Yeah, we've we've had a lot of success when we've shown the graphic of the two school, school buildings and you might have, you know, one school building, one elementary school that has a total of 500 students. Um, and it has 250 students who are eligible for free and early supplies meals, but you have another school that's got 750 students, and it has you know 350 students, so more than the 250, but it get, does not get that additional high poverty lap funding because it doesn't hit the 50% threshold. So it's a it's an, it was an arbitrary number when you have larger um, student populations in buildings. It, it will, it, it, um, it, it's a problem for them, right? It's a disconnect in getting the extra services that those students might need. So, and we've been successful in getting it through the house. It's just the Senate that has not been as, um, that's been kind of It's just move, is it moving the line or is it prorating it based on your actual? It's not about prorating. It's, so it's, it's moving the line as to including more schools? Yes, so, so. So that's what the ask has been, but I think now you're suggesting something, a completely different approach. To it. So we're, we're suggesting that we go back um, to the suggestion that I think was like three years ago, which is looking at the state average. I mean. We, we've tried to figure out, okay, what's the sweet spot to get the legislature to kind of nudge away. This was, um, this was the 50% threshold was set in the McCleary legislation in 2017 and didn't see the impact until that next year and said, oh, here's how it's playing out in the different school buildings. Um, so that's, then it was, okay, well, we need a solution for that. 
a lot of legislators really hard to wrap their head around, right? It's difficult to understand. Um, but Skylar Rood has been a champion. Uh, former Representative Bill Jenkins actually dropped the bill. So, you know, we've been chipping, chipping away. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's now in talking to staff, it may not make sense to be targeting a number of students in a building as much as it might make sense to just say um, the, the more fair thing is to look at statewide poverty average. It would help Tukwila as well as helps Pasco. So how many more schools would, if we succeeded in this and it was the statewide average, how many more schools would we include? Primarily, we have had schools on the bubble in West Pasco. So um, McClintock is one that has been around 47, 48%. Um, Franklin has been kind of right in that middle area, McGee, Angelo. Um, so we believe that with this approach, um, McLaughlin has also been right on the bubble. Um, and as the student populations have ebbed and flowed, those have changed, Scott, but we'd be looking at potentially three more buildings uh, that could, if we used the state average, would be able to qualify for the additional funding. And what would the additional funding give them? It more teacher, what you like, yeah. Sure, it would give them dollars to spend um, per student FTE, um, on uh, a variety of activities that are permitted under the LAP program. And so buildings have used that uh, LAP high poverty dollars to fund communities and schools. They've used the LAP high poverty dollars to fund um, social emotional supports, counselors for students, those types of things. Um, the, the primarily those um, those things that can be influenced by, um, by poverty um, impacting schools have been the target of those dollars. And about how many dollars would you get at the two elementaries and the middle school? And that I would have to get back to you on. I mean, you know, I that, that impacts us, right? Because yeah. if it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, is it worth, worth it if it's a million, you know? Except in that, that situation. I. I just remember a number of about $100,000 some in those schools, and um, those go directly to the schools. So that's huge for those principals' budgets, huge, where they can really help those kids that are higher poverty be because they tend to struggle more in school. So, so yeah. I think it's a big deal to those individual schools, even though it's not maybe a big deal to our overall budget. But in order of impact to our district, if we get $100,000 at three schools, we can add one program at each school or you know, one FTE or two FTEs, maybe not as big of an impact, nor near as big as number one, right? Sure, it's less That's of hard. a systems impact and more of an individual school impact. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so I've heard that one in, Five, we kind of want to prioritize one and five. Um, does everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay. So we talked about four. Do we want to drop four and put it on the back burner, or do we want to focus, or do we want to keep that on our five list? I wouldn't spend any calories, but that's that's just me. Steve. Yeah, I think it's it's a long shot, and it's going to be a long haul. And I I I think it we would. I'm not sure we would ever be successful with that because just because people would look at that and say, look, your kids aren't in school, you're not gonna have as much expense. And unless we can come up with a real, a real uh, something that we can show them, I think we're gonna have a hard time with that. Sherry? I, oh, go ahead, sorry, Steve, I didn't mean well, to get done. I was just gonna say, I, I agree, one in five and three. Um, on the high poverty lap, when we're talking about state average, I mean, I, I think this, 
this manifest itself one year when we had our schools, our smaller schools were getting lap money. We had schools that had more poverty students, but because they had more non-poverty students, they were just under the 50% mm -hmm. and weren't getting any money. And uh, so we had recommended that. If we dropped it down to 45, then there would have been two or three schools that got that money that qualified. And there's got to be a better way to do that. I don't know what that way is. I don't know that it's just moving the line because then if we just move it a little bit further, some other district might be benefited. So I, I don't know how much that benefits us. I, I wouldn't make that a real high priority myself, I guess, without a real solution that, that everybody in the state could get behind. How, what about you, Sherry? I kind of agree with I know that we have uh, a lot more nurses and um, social workers, th those kind of things than other districts do, but we pay for that. I mean, I know that there's a lot of, uh, of districts, <coughs> you know, Richland and Kennewick that don't have near the nursing staff that, that we do. So I, I know that it would help us if we had more, more funds to pay for that. So yes. I, I think that's a high priority. So district staff, if we stayed with one, two, and five, would that, as our three priorities, how do you feel about that? And are there other ones that would be a priority to you for any reasons? The only response I would have, I, I, my thoughts, Amy, on the, say one, three, and five. One, two, and five. One, Either two, one. and five. Mm -hmm. um, there, we have been, in the last few years, talking with legislators about the high poverty lap solution. So we have a lot of runway, and I think we've built up a lot of knowledge um, with them that if we go and talk to them about that now, um, we have some, some advocates on our side and, and, and um, people know that that, you know, that about that issue for us. So I, I hate to give up on it because we, we have, you know, time and education invested in that with them. Okay. I, I can see that, on, and we already passed it through the House, so hopefully we can pass it through the House again if we can get a few more senator, senators educated about that than the possibility. I, I like that one personally because I know what a difference it makes. Um, sometimes in schools like that, they, they need more um, interventions too in, in discipline and other ways that, that it's really helpful to have these things to the education of all, all kids in those schools. So it, it's a huge impact on each school, even though it might not be on our total budget. And I think we do need to take that into consideration. Would you all be okay if we added back three? I'm Please? fine yeah. with it. I, no, I, I'm okay with it. I think, so can you help me understand a little better when you, when you talk about using the average state student poverty percentage? I don't, don't know who wants to address that, but. I mean, right now it's 50%. If you have 50% of your students that are high poverty, you get the money. If you're 49 and a half, no deal. It, it's a rolling three-year average, which is meant to help smooth yep. so you don't kind of have a big cliff. Okay. Um, I think one of the challenges you have right now is you haven't been asking parents to turn in your, their, you know, lap, their free and reduced price meal forms because you've been funding all lunches and meals last year and this year. So I'm not sure how that impact is going to play itself out in the district. Um, and I think that's maybe one reason to be thinking about the statewide average. Um, so does the statewide average change the 50%? So could it drop down to 49 or the statewide or average is, up to 55? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm right sure now the, the statewide average, I'm sorry to interrupt, the statewide average is about 45%. Okay. Um, so it's under the 50%. The, 
the 50% was just something that when the McCleary gang of eight were trying to think of, hey, we know that there are school buildings, much like President Phillips mentioned, that you know need this additional boost and that money is gonna go directly to the building. It's not for the district for allocation. Um, and we're gonna set it at 50%. And they just, it was just an arbitrary number. It was like, okay, that's a nice round number. We'll say anybody's got 50% or more poverty, um, they'll get this extra boost. And you know, the, the ramifications when it plays out in the field, um, there's impact, uh, particularly when you've got uh, some of the, the larger number of student populations in your buildings. So uh, as long as it's tied to something, that's great. I, I mean, I agree, 50% was arbitrary. And if we're just going and saying, well, let's move it down to 45, which it's I think arbitrary. It's still arbitrary. <laughs> That's but, it, but it is a statewide average, and so at least it is tied to something. Right. But, it, but it, a, a better argument, right, would be if you have more than 200 students at a school, we can efficiently use the money and have an um, efficient and well-rounded program. If you have 100 students at a school, maybe it doesn't work with the amount of money you get. That, that would be a non-arbitrary number, but we're just asking them to go from one arbitrary number, 50, to 45, which is another arbitrary non number. I understand it's a statewide number, but there's no research or anything that says if you have 45% at your school, you need this help, and if you have 44, you don't. I, so if, if I can respectfully push back just a little sure. bit, Scott, I think that the, um, for, so in talking to legislators about this, because that, that has been some of the conversation has been, well, what is that critical mass that you need to be able to run an efficient program? And so in some ways that's an arbitrary number too, because that depends on what your program is. So if we use an existing state benchmark that's easy to determine in the data where we say, there is additional funding for schools in the state that, are a, that have a higher than average, higher than state average percentage of their student population um, who um, qualifies for free and reduced lunch, then th 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 there's something there we can tie it to. And if we use that benchmark, I, I was looking up our state um, lap data for this year, we would have four schools that don't currently qualify that would qualify. So you're talking about uh, bringing additional dollars to McClintock, Columbia River, Edwin Markham, and um, where's the other one? And Franklin which have traditionally been larger schools. So, so we get there without having to worry about what is that critical mass of students. And, and I understand that just, again, it, we're asking for it because it helps us, but if a lot of our numbers were at 43%, our argument is still 43% of our large schools is enough students that they need right. help. Our argument is still there we're asking them to arbitrarily draw the line on a number that we picked out because it's a hard number that we can point to. Well, but, but when I hear you guys all talk, it's this isn't fair because we have, we have 240 you know, students of poverty, but we're at 40, 46%. You know? Well, if we were at 44%, 243%, or 243 students, we'd still be saying it's not fair and trying to choose another number. So. I, I don't argue that we should do it, and I, I know that it would help us. It's just our basis for why the number should be there, I would think would still be hard. The st I understand it's a hard number that the state poverty line's at, but someone could push back and say, why does that matter? And uh, uh, so uh, I know we wanna wrap this up, because I know you have other things on your work session agenda, but um, to make it just kind of more real, um, last year the legislature decided that they were going to do fund a 0.5 school counselor for every high poverty school. So again, you have four schools that if it was at state average would get that 0.5 school counselor, but they're not going to get it because they're under, even if their student population that qualifies 
is higher than a school that is meeting it. So it's, it, that's where it has a, a real ramification. The, the more the legislature says and uses that term high poverty school to, to qualify for anything, they could say, well, we're gonna do it for only high poverty schools get an extra nurse. Only high poverty schools get this. And so that's, that's where it becomes really uh, important, I think, to, to have that distinction. How, how many districts would sign on with this? How many districts would moving it from 50% to 45% have enough impact on them to sign up with us? I, I think there would be a lot of districts. I, it's, you know, one of the things that we, w that we did last year and the year before was we, we only did elementary schools, so we didn't make it relevant to the middle or high so that they can keep, and that was a smaller universe, a smaller amount of money. Um, and then we, we dealt with elementary schools even further that were, that were 600 students or more, right? Um, that may not be the valid number to, to be at anymore. Um, it, and, and again, that was kind of arbitrary in our sense, but a prototypical school is 400 students in an elementary school. So we said, if you've got one and a half times the number of kids in a prototypical school, you, you should be able to, to get that extra high poverty or lower to the state average. I don't know if I'm making sense. So, so my, my question's <laughs> but, more simple. It's gonna pull but three districts. It, it's three gonna pull a lot of, district. a lot of districts in. I think the hundreds question of is, schools? It, yes, the question would be, where do you wanna draw the line? Because if you say all schools, then it's a big number. If you say elementary schools, you start small and it still is gonna have a statewide impact, but it's not going to be the millions of dollars required if you said all schools. So it's a, it's a policy call that this board could maybe have at, a, at another time, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I hate to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I just feel like we should know the overall state impact if we're asking them to do it. If, is it in the ballpark of it's gonna cost you $3 million or $100 million or more than that? I'll give you an example. So last year when we were looking at um, this qualifying for only elementary schools, only with 600 students or more hitting 45% quali qualifying for free and reduced price meals, there were eight school districts. And it was about 11 schools across the state. And I think the number was about 3 million. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a huge impact but again, we narrowed and narrowed so that we could kind of get foot in the door. So I would suggest let's leave it on there. I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't prioritize it real high, but just so that it doesn't get lost, we can, let's keep it on there. And then move four down to the bullets. I, I like the bullets. I think they're all good things, but when you're going to talk to a legislator, you're gonna hit three or two or three subjects anyway, and the rest of them are gonna be going to be lost so and I think if, if those are the three if we can prioritize those three when I say three not not to drop the high poverty lap off the list but prototypical school funding model transportation and then special education okay is everyone all right with that well that sounds like you have a direction then thank you for coming okay thank you our meeting we will now recess into executive session. Yes, so we are requesting executive session under 42. <laughs>